Chapter 17 to 18. Harry gained much from his trip today, even more than those sorcerers thought he did. Harry confirmed that they could sense the dimensional energy Harry absorbed and used, but they couldn't sense Harry's exotic energy or spells cast with it. Harry placed a tracking spell on each of them so he could figure out where they went. Shortly after Harry left he felt them vanish from the area and appear in another part of London. What was interesting was that his tracking spell was purged the moment they arrived at their destination. Harry didn't think it was intentional, more like their destination automatically scrubbed those who arrived even if nothing was sensed. Harry returned to his animagus form and flew to the area and found a large, ancient, four-story building along a quiet street. Harry had seen this building several times while flying about and always admired the architecture. The reason he initially noticed it was that it was, relatively speaking, built around the convergence of several sources of dimensional energy which Harry could feel flowing through the world. If Hogwarts was built on the location with the strongest concentration of exotic energy, this place had the strongest concentration of dimensional energy. Harry wondered if he looked around the world for other sources of energy would he find other magic users. No, that would probably lead to things that would kill him. Harry also noticed for the first time the location had some of the sturdiest wards he'd ever felt. Their structure was there before, he just hadn't noticed they formed a ward when he first felt them as he wasn't familiar with dimensional energy then. Harry felt that the wards also couldn't see his exotic energy which was pretty cool. They seemed to react to his new dimensional energy, but Harry felt they wouldn't trigger unless he actually cast magic with it or drew an energy from it. This meant the ward would likely go off if he used battle meditation here. Something to think about later. Harry flew beyond the wards and operat back home. His stats as an owl were the same as a human, which meant he could use wandless magic, apparate, and make use of his physical agility and strength when he wanted. Harry tested this by clocking his flight speed at 600 km per hour which is about half the speed of sound, about 8 times faster than a normal snowy owl's top speed. Not that he could keep that up for long. Eventually he'd run out of stamina and have to rest or eat to recover it. Harry spent the rest of August practicing with dimensional energy and even asked Dumbledore about it and about sorcerers in general. Dumbledore was most surprised Harry encountered sorcerers but when he remembered the nature of Harry's undetectable magic, it seemed possible. He explained in a letter what had been explained to him when he was the chief mugwump of the ICW. Sorcerers are kept unknown to witches and wizards and all contact with them is classified. Most common knowledge about them is spread through word of mouth alone. There are more witches and wizards than they are sorcerers but reports on the strength of sorcerers have always been highly varied. The strangest piece of information is that sorcerers are all muggles though reports that Merlin was also a sorcerer seem to counter this. Many records of battles between them and witches and wizards show the magic shields of sorcerers were completely ineffective against wizard magic attacks. Yet other reports show the opposite, with wizard magic having no effect against a sorcerer who was able to easily defeat very powerful wizards. What many reports agreed on was that in one way or another sorcerers seem to be guardians or protectors of some kind. Their power is noted to be capable of far more than wizards in many cases allowing them to do what would be impossible for a wizard. Dumbledore explained his own theory that sorcerers can use many different forms of energy. Some can only use forms that are weak against wizard magic while some can use energies which are strong against wizard magic. Harry understood what this implied. Exotic energies could rewrite the laws of reality but only on a small, specific scale. Apparition itself was a simple means of using exotic energy to literally pierce through dimensional energy and reach another location. Many wizard spells could easily pierce dimensional energy. But there were other energies that were not so easy to fight. That being said, Harry wanted to get the feel of dimensional energy first before he branched off into other forms of energy. By the end of August, Harry's magic path rank had risen to 23 which was around the same rank as Dumbledore. That was also where he met a roadblock. Harry was able to mold dimensional energy into a shield or short sword, but every time it would fizzle out after only a few moments. Harry did his best to imitate that mortal guy and allowed energy to be absorbed into his body and channeled through the energy already in his body to shape it. Absorbing it wasn't difficult for someone with energy sense. Controlling it wasn't that bad once he figured out the trick to it. The problem was that once he had it shaped and it was outside his body, his control over it slipped and it fizzled out every time. If ambient dimensional energy was water, the dimensional energy inside him tuned to his life and soul was ice. Absorbing ambient energy into the ice would allow Harry to freeze it into a shape and use that shape. But a few moments after it left the body, the ice returned to water and Harry couldn't figure out how to stop it from melting. He was trying to figure out what to do when he got a new notification. Ping. New quest, 
back to school get accepted as a student in the London branch of the Sanctum Sanctorum. Harry immediately opened his map and confirmed the quest destination, the Sanctum Sanctorum, was in fact that building he saw earlier. Yep, that was the one. After making 100% sure he wouldn't get a hell mode pop-up again he made his decision. Harry wrote a few letters to various individuals and packed his things. Goose, we're going to another magic school. This one has sorcerers instead of wizards. Goose responded mentally, you're just looking for more trouble again aren't you? Harry smiled and said, you know me so well. Hell mode or not, Harry doubted he would get bored. Harry purchased a new wardrobe of plain clothes the monks would likely be fine with and filled a suitcase with them along with two towels and a new toothbrush. He got a P.O. box and set all male owls to forward to the goblins who would mail the actual letters to his P.O. box in the future. After making Potter Manor vanish again, Harry operat with Goose and his suitcase a few blocks from the place and walked up from the street. It wasn't on a large property in a gated off area he'd have to sneak into. It was actually on a side street down a dead end alley across from a park. Something he found funny was that his own crossing of the ward near the building didn't do much but the ward seemed very interested in Goose. It didn't directly reject the flurkin, but it did seem to go over Goose's intention with a fine tooth comb. Harry had to stop himself from cackling as what may have been the most powerful, the most advanced ward Harry had ever encountered was now determining that his cat intended to spend as much time as she could, sleeping, and lying down in sunbeams. Once the ward confirmed Goose's intention to seek sunbeams to lay in was not dangerous, it stopped bothering the flurkin. Harry directly knocked on the front door and waited about three minutes before someone answered. It was not someone he saw from the group earlier and was wearing a suit instead of a monk's robe, but Harry still felt the presence of a large amount of dimensional energy in the man. The doorman looked at Harry carrying a suitcase in one hand and a pet carrier in the other and said, Can I help you? Harry smiled and said, I came to learn magic. The man said, I'm sorry child but you have come to the wrong place. Before he could close the door Harry said, tell me this isn't a place where magic can be learned and taught. I'm sorry but you are not expected. Harry said, wait, so you only let people you expect in? How is that fair? I didn't know I was supposed to be expected. The man was far more confused than Harry was. He actually recognized the boy as Wong had told him of their encounter the prior month. The ancient one was consulted and stated the boy would not return. Yet here he was. Never in the man's life had he known the Ancient One to be wrong. Harry continued to stand there holding the heavy-looking suitcase and pet. After considering the fact that the Sanctum let him through, he figured the child was not dangerous and said, you may come in but you'll have to wait. There is someone I must speak with. Harry took a step in and said, thank you. My name is Harry Potter. This is Goose. Greetings Harry Potter, my name is Sol Rama, protector of the London branch of the Sanctum Santorum. Harry was escorted to a chair and proceeded to wait. Sol quickly walked up to the third level which had portals to the other sanctums and Kamartage. He entered the ladder and made his way to the room of the Ancient One before knocking. Come in. The bald woman greeted Sol but was a bit confused as to why he was here. He said, Ancient One. The boy Master Mordo spoke of. The one you said would not be seen again. He had come to the London Sanctum and asked to learn magic. It was then that Sol saw something few in living memory had ever seen on the Ancient One's stoic face. She was surprised. Truly, she asked. And I did not see it. It seems there are still things I cannot see. She got up and walked out of her room to the portals with Sol following behind. Only a few minutes after Sol had left Harry on the bench he had returned with a young-looking bald woman in tow. However Harry felt her presence was heavier than Dumbledore and the resurrected Voldemort combined. She was further above them than they had been above Harry on his first day at Hogwarts. Harry felt half a dozen different types of energy within her. The arrangement was off though. The strongest concentration of energy was some type of dark energy while the others seemed to be arranged around it to balance the dark energy out. She noticed his attention and said, Hello child. I am called the Ancient One. Harry said, Hello, I am called Harry, though I don't need to shave. I am the godson of one called Sirius, though he will deny being serious with every breath. The woman smirked at the gentle glib that her title didn't match her appearance. This encounter was a first for her since her ascension to Sorcerer Supreme. It was her first time meeting someone she didn't know she would meet. For centuries she had been using a tool to see into her own future so she pretty much knew everyone she was going to meet from then until the day she died. She never once saw Harry though. 
When Mordo and Wang spoke of a child who seemed to be a natural at the mystic arts, it confused her as she never saw someone like that using the eye of Agamotto. She convinced herself it was a one-time anomaly and since she never saw such a student train in Kamartage, she believed the child would never cross paths with them again. Yet she was wrong. Even her most recent viewings of her future lacked this person. Why? For the first time in centuries she found something she was unsure about. That wasn't a bad thing though. She picked up the amulet hanging around her neck and looked into the future with it. Doing so would let her see a conversation before it happened. She could then instead have a different conversation and see that. In this way she could have many first conversations with someone and learn much about them without giving much away about herself. However for the child it didn't work. When she looked into the future, the child wasn't there. She couldn't tell what he said and the future she saw didn't have her asking any questions or hearing any answers. This child was somehow shielded, or invisible from the perspective of the future. Whatever gave this child such a gift was even more powerful than the Eye of Agamotto which was powered by an infinity stone. That was both fascinating and disturbing. Harry simply saw her pick up her necklace, frown, then look back and Harry and ask, so tell me not Harry Harry, godson of the not serious serious. Why do you wish to learn magic? Harry smiled that she got his bad joke and said, two reasons. First, I like to help people and learning here will definitely be good. The second is that there is a 100% chance I'll need it later in life since there is no chance I am going to have a boring life. What makes you say that? She was honestly interested in his own opinion on the matter. It was certainly unusual for a child to be so certain their future required learning the mystic arts. Well for one, I have what I'm pretty sure is a familiar bond with this, not a cat. The Ancient One looked at the small case carrying the orange cat and for the first time sensed that it was most certainly not a cat. It looked like a cat of course and seemed to behave like a cat, but this creature had a naturally occurring pocket dimension within that she would not have noticed if she didn't look for it. She'd never seen a living creature like this before, not on this plane anyways. On further examination she could determine it did in fact have a bond with the child. It was very strong too. She considered it for a few moments and said, there are other ways of protecting yourself you know. Becoming a sorcerer means taking up to duties of defending the realm from those who seek to harm it. Harry shrugged and honestly answered, chances are I'll have to do that in the future even if I didn't learn sorcery. The ancient one was more than a little surprised at how sure of this the child was. She said, I heard you use some sorcery a month ago. Have you made any progress? She remembered her amusement when Wong had told her the child's passing remark that he would figure it out himself. As he was asking to learn now, she wanted to see if the boy could be embarrassed at the fact he likely didn't make any progress. Harry sighed and crafted a short sword from dimensional energy for her to examine. It was made of rust-colored interweaving arrays of light as most dimensional constructs were and it was cleanly outlined. A moment later it fizzled out and the Ancient One smiled. She said, a construct needs a small but constant input of dimensional energy to retain its form or it will break down. Harry thought about it for a moment and smacked his forehead. Oh, now it was obvious. He was trying to water a garden by turning the hose off after the water started coming out. Harry focused again but this time after the construct was made, he continued to refresh it over and over by adding more energy into it. This time the sword stayed solid and did not waver. Harry smiled and said, thank you. I feel really stupid now. The Ancient One raised an eyebrow at the remark. For most initiates, surrendering to the energy, absorbing it, directing it, and shaping it were the hard parts. All that Harry had done easily. He just didn't know what to do next. Now she was a bit torn. On one hand, Harry could become a powerful sorcerer. So much skill at such a young age and his potential was higher than her predetermined successor who wouldn't show for another decade or so. On the other hand, if Harry went bad, she wouldn't know until it was too late. However, when was not being able to see a person's future a crime? It was known that Kamartage would teach anyone willing to learn, but technically that was only for people who arrived at Kamartage themselves and Harry was still in London. After a moment more of contemplation she said, you may learn the mystic arts from here Harry but only if you pass a test. If you do not, then you may not learn until you are taller than I am. Um. Okay. It wasn't like he had a choice. Besides, his inner Gryffindor wouldn't let him just back away from a challenge. She escorted Harry to the fourth floor where Harry saw numerous items behind glass cases. His senses informed him each contained a masterpiece of arranged energy for a purpose, true artifacts, though he would later learn they called them relics here. 
She walked him through a door and within was a small ritual room with a sphere that had a gentle white glow on a pedestal. This is the ancient orb of Agamotto. Or should I say the original? There is a different one that shares the same name which monitors threats throughout the world in Kamartage, but this one predates it and was created by the founder of our order, the first sorcerer supreme, Agamotto himself. I want you to place your hand on it. Harry felt the presence of so many types of powerful energy from the orb that he had no means to differentiate what any of it was. Harry didn't mind though and placed his hands on the orb. The Ancient One knew this was highly irregular. The orb could sense the heart and many of the secrets of the person it scanned. It was a tool which allowed one to sense if specific entities were threats and using it on a potential student was never done. The orb however glowed pure white, signifying a pure heart and pure intentions. The Ancient One saw several images appear within the light, but she only recognized one of them. It was a phoenix. The phoenix to be precise. She also recognized what may have been the source of the child's talent. He was a mutant and seemed to have a pocket space within his soul. There were some other things but she couldn't make heads or tails of them. However the pocket space would have answered a few questions. The cat had a pocket space as well so their similarities could have forged the familiar connection. Having a natural pocket space could explain how using dimensional energy was so natural for him. Okay, you can remove your hands. Harry did so and the orb stopped glowing. Even the orb couldn't detect Harry's exotic energy so the Ancient One only saw the dimensional energy within Harry as well as small amounts of natural energy which he sometimes used battle meditation off. The Ancient One said, if you are serious about defending the realm, then I welcome you as a student. Harry said, thank you, but I think you have me confused for my godfather. I'm Harry, he's serious. She rolled her eyes and escorted him back to collect his things. She noticed he was surprised at the portal she led him through but not that surprised. So tell me about yourself Harry. Well, I can, but only if you promise not to tell others. I don't want others to know how much of a trouble magnet I am. At least until they figure it out themselves. She smiled at this and said, very well. I will not tell others of your past. Harry felt a field of energy he didn't recognize and figured it was monitoring the conversation. Best guess. Lie detector. He certainly knew how to have fun with those. Well, my full name is Harry James Potter. I turned 12 on July 31st. I was born to a witch and wizard who were members of a counter-terrorism strike force. They got betrayed by a rat and both were killed by a terrorist leader, Halloween of 1994. I spent the next nine years living in a cupboard under the stairs of my aunt's house. I died in 2003 and came back to life in 2004, don't ask what happened. I spent last year going to magic school where I killed a basilisk, challenged a nesting dragon, defeated a newly resurrected immortal dark lord, and killed 24 of his evil fanatic followers along with 100 dementors. I've also just about memorized every text of wizard magic that exists and I'm looking to branch out. The ancient one stopped at the third sentence and grew more and more serious after each one. She had to double check that her spell to ensure it was indeed functioning properly because if it was, then he was telling the truth. She looked back at him and said, you're a wizard Harry. Harry nodded and said, I guess. Not sure. Haven't been quite sure of what I am after the coming back to life thing. She asked, are you aware you are a mutant? Yeah, I was told no wizard ever awoke the X gene without dying first and I just happened to win the genetic lottery. Though I was told the hand of others were involved. I see now where your confidence in encountering trouble comes from. Now did you actually kill a hundred dementors or did you drive them away? Harry wasn't surprised she knew what a Dementor was and said, find a spot where there is no one around for 20 miles and I'll show you. She smirked at the challenge and waved her hand in a circle which caused sparks of dimensional energy to follow the path of her hand. From Harry's energy sense it was like she was twisting space into a tunnel, though there were other processes Harry didn't understand yet. A moment later the sparks formed a circle which turned into a portal. Harry followed her through it into the Sahara Desert, the hottest place Harry had ever been. He then took a Patronus grenade from his inventory and lightly banished it a few dozen meters away. The grenade went off and the massive silver dragon materialized. Harry was paying very close attention to the Ancient One and noticed that the dark energy within her recoiled in the presence of the overpowered dragon Patronus. However this didn't seem to harm her which meant that she hadn't synchronized with the dark energy and it hadn't synchronized with her, thus she lacked the taint of darkness. It was an odd arrangement that seemed more trouble than it was worth. The Ancient One was once more surprised. She could sense that space around the dragon was being actively purified through the sheer force of positive emotions, light, love, and happiness. 
however she could not feel the dragon itself. She realized with certainty that Harry's wizard magic was invisible, even the orb of Agamotto didn't show it. If Harry hadn't told her, she would not have known. She understood the implications right away. Harry was trusting her with this. She said, thank you for showing me this Harry, I won't speak of it to others. I will however remind you that most of the masters of Kamartage would recognize wizard magic if they see it, even if they can't sense it. Harry nodded and said, I've already got a lot of practice in wizard magic, I'm not here to practice that. Indeed, though if you ever need a place to practice away from the eyes of others, come find me. Ping. Quest complete, back to school reward, sling ring, perk. Harry wondered why the quest hadn't pinged yet though the so-called ancient one already told him he passed the test. Unless, ah, uh, another test. If he lied or hid too much she may not have trusted him and may have held back in his teachings or worse, sabotaged them. That being said every single thing Harry told her was things known by others. If she investigated it herself and put some effort into it, she could have learned it all so there was no point in holding back. It was the same as training under Sirius, telling his godfather he was weaker than he actually was would not have helped in making him stronger. The Ancient One opened up another portal and returned to the location from before. She said, if you are already learned in magic, do you have a specific branch of interest? Harry nodded and said, before I answer, what do you know of my mutation? There is still plenty about it even I don't get. There was much that eluded me as well. But I could see that you have a pocket dimension within you that can store objects and energies. Harry was somewhat thankful his body's status as a stable obscurial was not discovered. His actual mutation kept his obscurus form the same as his human form which was what allowed him to gain levels and revive after death. The inventory seemed to be an add on like the pause function and menu. However he had no problem with people thinking his inventory was his mutant power for now. Harry said, I call it my inventory. Anything I put inside it becomes a part of me but separate from me. I also somehow gain a complete understanding of whatever I place in there. If I place a book in there, I have access to all that is written as if I memorize the image and text of every page. I can also gain an understanding of how something works if I place it in there. Harry waited a few moments for the Ancient One to understand the implications before he continued. Because of this, I like to place technology and magic items in my inventory to figure out how they work. I like to make things which have been called artifacts. That spell grenade I used earlier had the power of 20 Patronus charms stuffed into it which forced the magic to condense into a critical mass before exploding out. The Ancient One could easily see how useful and how dangerous such an ability could be. It also allowed her to recall what Wong had told her. She said, Wong told me you said to him, I've read everything. And earlier you said you've memorized every wizard magic. How many books do you have in that inventory at the moment? Not as many as I used to. Memorizing information from a book is much easier when it is in my inventory. But I don't forget what I've memorized so if the book was borrowed I return it after memorizing it. Harry took a breath before saying, so, because of my inventory, I've become interested in the branch of enchanting and artifact creation. I recently got all the books on goblin enchanting so I want to further my study into that. The Ancient One was curious how Harry had gotten enchanting tomes from the goblins as they were known for never disclosing their methods. More than a few relics in the sanctum were forged by goblins so she knew the quality of their work. The only reason they allowed it was because Harry promised never to share it and if he ever broke that promise all the gold he possessed would be forfeited to the goblins and he would become their employee for the remainder of his days. She said, artifact creation requires precise control, a structured mind, a thorough understanding of magic, and a lot of imagination. I can see why you would be interested, but the truth of the matter is that artificers are few and far between in all of recorded history. There hasn't been one in the sanctum for centuries and most of the well-known ones of the past are never human. Why do you think that is? Because humans aren't strong enough. She shook her head, not quite. It is because humans are not long-lived enough. The amount of time the true masters have put into the study and practice of their craft far exceeds a human's lifetime. Even for the humans who are long-lived through various means and gifts, few if any would be interested enough in artifact creation to devote themselves to it enough to reach the skill of the ancient masters. Oh. He really couldn't think of another response. A few sorcerers in training noticed Harry being escorted by the Ancient One through the foyer. According to Harry's map the portal had taken them somewhere in the mountainous region of Asia. He'd have to explore a little for his map to fill out and get more details. The Ancient One found the one she was looking for and said, Ah, Kisilius. There is someone I'd like you to meet. 
After a quick introduction and request of the man, the Ancient One left the pair to their own devices. The man called Kisilius was also a British citizen and more than happy to show his fellow countrymen around. He said, you are by far the youngest disciple I have ever seen here. Harry said, I think there was a question there but I'm not sure I heard it. Kisilius smiled wryly and said, we all have a reason to be here. I am here for truth. Some are here for healing or strength. I cannot think of a reason for one so young as yourself to be here. Oh, that. Well I just happen to love magic and I figured I could learn it here. I also like helping people and magic will probably help with that. The fellow British national frowned disapprovingly. Magic is not something that should be sought on a whim. Maybe, Harry answered. Kisilius showed Harry around the temple and the notable features of each building. Meditation rooms, library, cafeteria, and living quarters. He told Harry that evening practice would begin in an hour and if he wished to start his training it would be wise to observe. The manager of the living quarters gave Harry a room number that would be his sleeping quarters for his stay. It was larger than he thought but that could have just been because he was small. It has a small shower, a bed, a table, and even a window. Harry set his stuff down there and let Goose out of her carrying case. Harry set a litter box and bowls for food and water in the space below his bed along with a charmed pet bed that stayed warm. Harry also used transmutation magic to reshape the bottom of his door into a cat door. Although transmutation was far more difficult than transfiguration, it was permanent so the door would not change back. Goose filled herself with water and promptly used the cat door to leave and begin the investigation of her new surroundings. And lastly Harry cast a powerful security and locking charm on the door. What made it useful was that people wouldn't even know it was locked with magic as the magic he used to cast it was undetectable. Harry was surprised they didn't have any robes for him but it was more of a didn't have any robes in his size thing than not having anything at all. Harry couldn't transmute clothing very well and using transfiguration would saturate the clothes in exotic energy which had its own problems. Luckily the simple clothes he bought were acceptable and he would have his own robes in a week. Harry returned to the spot Kisilius told him would have evening practice and found that several disciples were sparring already. Harry sensed Mr. Grumpy's approach from behind him and set his hand on Harry's shoulder. Harry was tempted to try a judo throw but was too short to make it work and he never practiced it before. Mr. Grumpy, or Mordo as he was called, seemed disappointed Harry hadn't flinched. Harry said, we meet again Mr. Grumpy. I'm Harry by the way. And what pray tell are you doing here, child? Well Mr. Grumpy I was taking my cat for a walk. Have you seen him by the way? Orange tabby cat, about 218 years old. Shoots terrifying tentacles from its mouth. Her name is Goose. Think you're funny do you? This is no place for a child. I can tell. All the no children allowed posters really convinced me. I suppose I should be on my way. Do you know the bus fare for a ride from here to London? The man took a deep breath and shook his head. He was not oblivious to the fact that Harry wouldn't be here unless he was allowed to be here. He just didn't like those who didn't take training seriously and loathed those who relied on others to protect themselves. Children usually fit both criteria and he wanted to see how easily Harry got scared. Suffice to say, he was impressed. No flinch, not backing down and even standing his ground when directly confronted. If you truly intend to learn here, child, then you must understand that you will fight. If you are not strong enough when that day comes, you will die. Mordo kept his hand on Harry's shoulder and felt his heart rate. What he discovered surprised even him. There was no reaction. No fear, no nervousness. It was as if Harry was being informed of something as mundane as the weather. Harry said, that is true whether I learn here or not. Still no increase in pulse. Mordo couldn't determine lies though magic like the ancient one could, but he had his own tricks. He could sense and if he needed, draw in energy from others during physical contact. With his hand on Harry's shoulder he was confident he would feel if he was lying or if he was genuine. Very well Harry. I am Carl Mordo. When receiving my instructions here you will address me as Master Mordo. Harry turned to face him and gave a polite bow, thank you Master Mordo. He released his hand from Harry's shoulder and nodded. He had at least confirmed he did not lack in resolve. He was also able to clearly see the child's aptitude as Harry already had a heart palace that looked far stronger than it should considering it was only a few months old. The heart palace technique was both the most difficult and most rewarding form of energy control. Until now, the only current practitioners were himself and his teacher, the Ancient One. The main reason why he was so skeptical was that, 
in a sense, Harry was too good to be true. Mordo believed that the enemies of sorcerers were the enemies of balance, and sorcerers needed strength to kill them. Harry was talented and young and perhaps some decades in the future would become a strong sorcerer to protect the balance and natural order of the world. Only time would tell. Once the practice session began, Harry sat to the side and watched. Mordo and the one called Wong would walk through the rows of acolytes rating their progress and giving advice when needed. The main practice each day was feeling out and controlling dimensional energy. Harry determined at that point that the energy sink trick he stole off Mordo was only used by Mordo and the Ancient One. Through his senses he felt that the trainees didn't have a small piece of dimensional energy that synchronized to the signature of their life and soul. The other masters did seem to have an accumulation of dimensional energy within they could use to control external energy, but it was an indirect control instead of a direct control. They would simply keep practicing with the hope that some energy would stay in their body as they practiced with it. Harry thought the way Mordo did it was a good trick and wondered why it wasn't taught more often. He had no idea that the Ancient One used her foreknowledge to determine whether or not a student would be capable of learning it or not beforehand. If not, they were not taught it. If they could learn it, they were taught that method and that method only. The Ancient One thought only Mordo and her successor Stephen Strange would ever master the Heart Palace, but she was pleased to be wrong. After asking a few questions Harry had something of a game plan. This place not only taught magic but martial arts which incorporated magic. He didn't want to be noticed so easily so he would spend whatever would be a normal amount of time practicing energy control before, finally, getting the hang of magic and learning the fun stuff. Until then he would work on his warrior path rank and try to get it to 20. In his spare time Harry decided to work on his enchanting studies and study his new toys. It wasn't just the goblet of fire he could analyze. Harry already got into contact with Nicholas Flamel and told him he had his stone. The ancient alchemist told him to keep it but not tell anyone. The letter stated that many different forces both magical and mundane had been after him for many years due to that stone and it was only recently that he asked his best student to look after it for a while so he could have a break. The circumstances however convinced him the stone was better left missing and if no one knew Harry had it, he should keep it that way. He also told Harry he had enough elixir to get his affairs in order and would soon be on his way to the next great adventure. The end of the letter stated that after they died he would leave all his books to Dumbledore and Harry could ask to borrow them if he wanted. That however wouldn't be for a few years so he had to make do with what he had. The composition of the Philosopher's Stone itself reminded Harry a bit of his spell grenades when they reached critical mass. The arrangement of the exotic energy densities within the stone was like a large amount of spells compressed into critical mass then solidified before it could blow. The critical mass exotic energies would have different properties compared to the energies prior to going critical. However under no circumstance could Harry carelessly take it out of his inventory. The sheer density of exotic energy would destroy every electronic within a hundred feet and he had been told there were ways of tracking the stone's energy presence. Those ways had been why the Flamels rarely got a moment of peace and why they requested Dumbledore to look after it for a while. Harry even learned that the stone was in Gringotts for a time and someone tracked the energy of the stone and broke into Gringotts to find it. Luckily it had been moved hours before but at least now Harry had some understanding of why Dumbledore didn't bother hiding it. The fact that Harry had the stone yet the means to search for it came up with nothing meant that Harry for some reason was able to block the energy presence of the stone. It was only due to this the Flamels decided to let him keep it. Thanks to that, Harry hadn't taken it out even once since he got it. Thankfully he didn't need gold or the elixir of life. And so Harry's days of training began. The first thing he would do each day was enter the library, discreetly place several books into his inventory, then pause and read them all. Few were in English but many wizard tomes also covered a variety of languages and Harry had long since mastered most forms of communication, written or otherwise. Once Harry had memorized the contents and gone over them enough he would unpause and return them to the shelves and pick a book to bring to his room. Unfortunately the librarian became quite suspicious of him always coming and going and Harry had to lie and say that he was referencing something from the books he borrowed. The books were part esoteric, part crossword puzzle, and part reader's digest. Harry really did enjoy them. Many wizard books read like dictionaries. Full of information and you'll never use 95% of it while 99.9% .9 of it referenced itself. Much of the information did in fact overlap with what Harry had already learned which allowed him to cut down on pause time comprehending it. That and the fact that his scholar path broke through to rank 20 allowed him to learn and comprehend what he learned much more smoothly. After a month Harry figured he watched the forms enough and started participating in the morning and evening exercises. Surprisingly it did increase his warrior path even though the movements gave him no strain. 
Though Harry felt the increase in his path rank came not from his own movements but from the observation of the others. Harry used his energy sense to follow the path of channeled energies within the various disciples as they practiced. Through constant observation Harry was building up his own intuition of how energy traveled through a person's body as they fought meaning one day he might be able to predict a human's movement before they moved. Sure, he could do it with a dragon or a basilisk, but that was because they were huge and practically saturated with energy. A human is small and the relative energy within was weak, barely noticeable like a speck of dust on the air. Two months later Harry tried battle meditation for the first time since coming to Karmataj. It was awkward. Harry's battle meditation automatically generated foes made of the energy he chose to absorb which matched his level as long as it was within the range. Harry had obviously chosen to absorb dimensional energy since having more made controlling it a bit easier and it had a range of level 50 to level 200. Today the monsters oddly enough looked like a green spectral slenderman. It was creepy as hell and its arms would often shift between clawed fingers and sword-like appendages. Harry did his best to fight using a sword and shield of dimensional energy rather than something he conjured using wizard magic. Partway through the fight Harry heard from behind him, Hello Harry. Somehow or another the figure of the Ancient One had materialized behind him. Of course unexplainable situations were no cause for rudeness according to his mother so he said, Good evening Ancient One, how are you? Harry had to duck under a decapitating slash and strike the monster's knee. The problem with the Slender Man wasn't its durability, fast attacks, or often unpredictable movements. It was his height. It was at least double Harry's height meaning Harry had no real way to get a headshot without leaving himself vulnerable. The Ancient One responded. I'm doing very well, thank you for asking. You see I was meditating in the astral plane and I sensed a minor convergence of dimensional energies so I thought I'd have a look. Harry used his shield to parry another attack and did a half spin before bashing his shield into the monster's legs, sending it toppling down. Harry said, I see, did you find anything interesting? I did in fact. The dimensional energy seemed to coalesce into a green stranger, an uncommon resident of certain dimensions. They are considered quite dangerous and many a dimensional traveler has met their end before them. I've never seen one in the astral plane before. Harry used the moment the monster tried to get back up to pierce its side. He could have gone for the head but that always left him open for a counter-attack while attacking the side forced the monster to guard. Harry said, I see. That does sound dangerous. What do you think should be done? She continued observing Harry's fight for another minute or so. Since the monster matched Harry's level it wasn't something he could really hold much back on. True, he wasn't using wizard magic or his artifacts but he was looking to grind his path proficiencies, not jump up in level. If he rose in level too fast without ranking up his paths then one day he would find he was too weak to fight monsters of the same level. After another moment the Ancient One said, well the situation seems like it will resolve itself without any intervention. On an unrelated note, we haven't spoken since your arrival. Once you have some time, I'd like to invite you for tea. Harry threw his sword into the air, conjured an energy knife, stabbed into the monster's foot and caught his sword before chopping the bound leg off. He said, I will never refuse an offer to tea ancient one. He was British, he liked tea. It was genetic. After a few more moments he killed the creature which promptly dissolved into energy his body greedily absorbed. Was he pretty sure the ancient one was watching? Yes, yes he was sure she was watching. But he couldn't just pretend this didn't happen so he might as well deal with it. Harry finished his battle meditation and woke in his body. He made his way from his residence into the Ancient One's chambers where the tea was already being poured. Harry sat down respectfully and lifted the cup but waited a breath so he could savor the aroma. Afterwards he took a small sip, then a longer one. Yup, good tea. Harry asked, is that honey? Why yes. Do you like it? Yes, it's very good. She nodded and said, so how have you adjusted so far Harry? Harry took another sip and answered, it's better than Hogwarts. Why is that? It's probably just me. The teachers were very good at what they taught, Harry thought of Quirrell, Snape, and the ghost professor and added, most of the time. But they never taught me anything I didn't already know. It was too dangerous to ask since I was watched by people who wanted me dead so it was mostly self-study while I pretended otherwise. I suppose it wasn't the best learning environment for me. The Ancient One nodded. She had in fact done as Harry expected and did her research on Harry Potter. Everything matched what he told her yet it seemed he left quite a bit out as well. His antics of broadcasting the defeat of the most evil Dark Lord in the magical world's history on a television was certainly unique. 
The awkwardness of the meeting was harming Harry's preteen soul so he simply said, so, I'm guessing you want to know what that was. Yes, I would in fact. Would you like to tell me how you generated a being from another dimension composed out of dimensional energy you then absorbed after defeating? Harry considered how to word the answer and after a moment said, I'm not sure how it works but I've been calling it battle meditation. I can sense energy but I can't just absorb it, it won't let me. When I meditate the energy somehow turns into something I can fight. After beating it I can then absorb the energy. I can choose what energy I absorb, but I have no control over what actually forms. I've been doing this for a while now. You can sense different forms of energy in the world around us. This was surprising and usually impossible. In order to sense a specific form of energy, often you would have to blindly connect to it first and absorb it and if you got lucky over time and absorbed enough you'd be able to feel it then use it to feel the same type of energy around you. If you weren't lucky you could spend years trying to absorb something you can't even feel and find out you were never absorbing anything to begin with. Most mystics who had formed connections with multiple types of energy strong enough to sense it did so through making contact with the master of the dimension that form of energy originated from. For example, if one wished to be able to cast bolts of pure heat energy to fire at an opponent, one could connect to the realm of Balthak. The resulting spell was called the Bolts of Balthak. The Sorcerer Supreme tended to be the one who forged the most and the strongest connections with other dimensions thus granting the greatest power to defend the earth with. The problem with this approach was that it led to far too many deaths for the liking of the most recent Sorcerer Supreme which was why she locked many books which taught how to connect to the masters of other realms. Harry however could do it in reverse. He could sense an energy, then absorb it without needing to make contact with the masters of other dimensions. The Ancient One asked, what types of energy have you absorbed using this method? Exotic energy, dimensional energy, fire energy, sun energy, and nature energy, Harry easily listed off. Can you tell me what type of energies you sense here? You mean in this room or in you? The Ancient One raised an eyebrow and said, what exactly do you feel within me? Harry closed his eyes and concentrated. Darkness surrounded by nature, fire, ice, light, and of course pure dimensional energy. The others are synchronized with your life and soul like Mordo and myself are with dimensional energy but the darkness is not synchronized. In fact the other energies seem to be arranged around it to suppress it. Harry frowned as he noticed something else. Not a presence but an absence. He said, you don't have any time energy in your body. How does that work? The ancient one was so surprised at the last line she nearly spit up her tea. Thankfully Harry's eyes were closed so she would never have to admit to it. She asked, you can sense time energy. Harry opened his eyes and said, yes, but I'm much too weak to absorb it. So why don't you have any? Harry noticed that the ancient one seemed reluctant to speak of it so he added, I won't tell anyone since you're keeping my secret too. The ancient one gave a weak smile. That was like comparing an atheist and a devil worshipper who were hiding in a holy city. Both secrets were bad, but one simply did not compare to the other. Sorcerers did not like witches and wizards, but those who had contact with the dark dimension were to be killed on sight. She herself enforced that order. However she doubted Harry was the judging type so there was little point in hiding something he already knew. In fact, she felt that Harry may have known since they first met. It was better to explain now than it was later once Harry had acquired certain reading materials. The reason I lack time energy is due to the influence of the dark energy you sense. I've been stealing it from the dark dimension, a place beyond time and death. She expected some disgust when she told him of her sin, and she received it. But not at the admission of her sin. Harry only looked disgusted when she mentioned that the dark dimension was beyond death. She was curious so she asked, does that offend you Harry? A place beyond death? Of course it does. Life has no place existing in a place beyond death. She held back her smirk that Harry's opinion seemed to match her own. Immediately she realized how odd that was as she was almost 800 years old and Harry was 12. 12 years old children should not be so accepting of death. Then again, he did say something about dying and returning a year later. If you like this content, don't forget to like and subscribe. See you later, bye bye.